One time your son was watching, I'm like, oh, your son. Uh, I was. Hi, cat. Good morning, Cat Smith and Rodney and Gail Campbell. Good morning. Love you, Gail. Love you, Cat. And here's Jeff. Here's Mark. Good morning, Mark. And look at Wendy over here. Here's Wendy. Nelson. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Oh yes, I did see that. I did. I put. I think I put a heart or a care. Nothing compares to the promise. 
Up. It was wonderful. And that song, when I was at the vineyard in Texas, that song brought me back to the Lord when I was at a particularly rough patch in my life. So I love it. Thank you so much for singing it. We're so glad if you're here this morning, you're a visitor. We extend a warm welcome to you. We pray and trust. At Don, you're not a visitor. You've been here like a hundred years. <laughs> no, but we uh, pray and trust as you worship with us, you'll be drawn closer to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, closer to us as a church family, a community of faith. We uh, want to let you know that next Sunday uh, is Daylight Savings Time. How many people wait till 2 o'clock to advance their clock? Does anybody stay up till 2? Patrick, I knew you would. You CPAs, you got it, you know, it's all about numbers. Uh, so yeah, if you don't stay, if you do it before two, I don't think it's valid. But anyhow, uh, don't forget, just don't forget that. And Wednesday night at six thirty, we have our Lenten services, and uh, we're looking at seven things God detests. And this week, it's hands that devise wicked schemes. So I've enjoyed this series, and uh, I think we had a, a great service last Wednesday night. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. And now Annie has an announcement for us as well this morning. <laughs> all righty thanks so much Annie for that announcement all right let's all stand for our call to worship
Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a brief moment and ask the Holy Spirit, to show us where we fall short of God's standard of holiness, confess those sins, and receive the forgiveness that we have in the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. We may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. <clears throat> Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for us and for His sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by His authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>
time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years then forevermore Bless the Lord oh my soul Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written. Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? It was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord. To you, Lord Christ. He telephoned the police. Since there did not appear to be any foul play, the police referred the pastor to the health department. Well, they explained, since there was no health threat, you'll need to call the sanitation department. When the pastor called the sanitation department, the manager of the sanitation department said, I can't pick up that dead mule without authorization from the mayor. Pastor was not all too eager to call the mayor, who possessed a very bad temper and was always extremely unpleasant and hard to deal with. But eventually the pastor called the mayor anyway. The mayor did not disappoint the pastor. The mayor immediately began to rant and rave. After his continued rant at the pastor, the mayor finally said, Why did you call me? Isn't it your job to bury the dead? The pastor paused for a brief prayer and asked the Lord to direct his response. The Lord led the pastor to the words he was seeking. Yes, Mayor, it is my job to bury the dead, but I always like to notify the next of kin first. <laughs> the Lord led him. I mean, you know. 60% of businesses that closed down because of COVID are now permanently closed, according to Yelp. Yelp found that more than 160,000 businesses were forced to shut since the virus took hold. Nearly 100,000 of those businesses are closed for good. The are most affected by COVID-19, including California, Texas, Florida, and New York. 
But even before the pandemic, a number of company, companies listed in Jim Collins' bestseller, Good to Great, went belly up within 10 years. Do you remember Circuit City? It was outperforming General Electric in the year 2000. And how about Blockbuster? Minuet and I lived in McKinney, Texas, the world headquarters for Blockbuster. They built a massive complex to distribute all the videos. And it stood empty after a few years. Uh, we were even members of Blockbuster, if you can believe that. But before long, the distribution center had nothing going as Netflix pushed it out. And Borders, too, the booksellers, they, they closed as well. Experts cited many factors for the from the rise of the Internet, 9-11, and the recession that led to their demise just as COVID-19 has shut the doors of many a business now. Now this morning, our gospel passage has Jesus going in the temple, a going out of business sign. He and his disciples had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. This was one of three festivals that Jewish males were to attend each year. John puts this event early in Jesus' ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke put it late. Uh, it's possible that there were two cleansings of the temple, one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and one at the very end. Uh, John and the other Gospels uh, present complementary accounts of Jesus cleansing the temple. The temple was the center point of all life for the Jews. The first people of the Garden of Eden, where God and humans met face to face. There the priest offered sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. It was destroyed by the Babylonians when they took the Jews captive. The second temple was constructed by the Jews who returned from Babylon under Zerubbabel and was constructed in 519 B.C. Herod refurbished it and it was described by some as a snow-capped mountain that overshadowed Jerusalem. But it had been corrupted and co-opted by Israel's reaching out to false gods and idols. By the time Jesus and the disciples got there, it had become a shopping mall, a bank, a government building, and a national symbol. It was no longer the holy place God had originally intended it to be. The money changers and sellers made a profit selling sacrificial animals to the people, especially the poor. That kind of made it a mall. The treasury and records of debt were administered there, being a bank. And the scribal lawyers had their offices there, kind of setting up government. And the zealots looked to it as a national symbol that if it could be recaptured, could house a new government. Every interest group saw the temple as the symbol of salvation. That, but none of these functions were going to save it or the people. <clears throat> Luther called what the money changers and sellers did crass commercialism. Many of the poor who came to Jerusalem for Passover couldn't bring animals for sacrifice, so they had to buy them there. Consequently, the uh, poor paid exorbitant prices for these animals. On the other hand, the pilgrims had to exchange their money into the local currency uh, for the temple tax because the coins couldn't have any images on them, and the local bankers, the money changers, charged an exorbitant exchange fee as well. Seeing this, Jesus flies off the handle, starts throwing things at people. Does he? No, he doesn't. Not at all. Notice he made a whip out of cords. He didn't grab whatever was near him and throw it at somebody crazily. No, John tells us he made a whip of cords. He had to take a little time to make that whip. So his brain was engaged. And when we're extremely angry, that brain, that prefrontal cortex, the part that makes decisions, goes away. Time, if you can get some time in there, before when you have that anger and expressing that anger, you will do better. That's the whole principle for de-escalation training, which I did for a number of years. You see, Jesus didn't do that. He used the whip to drive the animals from the temple courts. We don't read in the Gospels that he hit anyone there. Also, he turned over the money chambers, changers' tables and scattered their coins everywhere. Now think about this. The temple belonged to whom? His father. And it was being profaned. 
It was nothing more than a secular market, and this angered Jesus greatly. But for once, the disciples linked his behavior with something that was in the Scripture. They realized Psalm 69.9 said, Zeal for your house will consume me. But his zeal wasn't for the drapes or the carpet or where the water fountain was. He wasn't upset over the color of the carpet. Luther put it this way when talking about Jesus' zeal for his father's house. Zeal is an angry love or a jealous love. His anger does not arise from hatred. It springs from love toward God. So how's our zeal for the Lord and his kingdom this morning? Or as Luther explained zeal, how is our love toward God? Are we jealously protecting his name, his word? When someone cusses in front of you and takes the Lord's name in vain, do you say anything? My college roommate said that to me when I did. It pulled me up short. He was protecting the name of the Lord. Do we do that? Do we do that? Are we seeking first his kingdom or ours? The temple was his father's house. It did not belong to the merchants or money changers or the pilgrim worshipers, or the priest. God's house was to be a place of prayer, a place where God came to the sinner and freely gave of his love and forgiveness. It belonged to his Father. Now how can we know that it was meant to be a place where God came to the sinner and freely gave of his love and forgiveness? When the Jews asked him for a sign that Jesus had authority to throw everybody out, what did he say? He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They think he's referring to the temple that has taken 46 years, it started with King Herod, to refurbish, and still wasn't finished. But he's not referring to that temple, he's referring to his body and his death for them on the cross. He is also telling them that he will be raised from the dead for them. And so in the midst of letting them know how they are dishonoring God, he offers them the grace of God. But they don't get it. None of the Jews, either the priests, the money changers, or sellers of animals, were glorifying God in the temple. It had become a house of merchandise in the first cleansing and a den of robbers in the second. <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, and Luke call the temple a den of robbers in their account reference to something the prophet Jeremiah had said 600 years earlier in Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11. There Jeremiah said, will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Apparently, the people of Jeremiah's day thought they could live any way they wanted as long as they came to worship and offered the sacrifices required of them. Do we think as long as we sacrifice our time and attend worship on Sundays that we can live any way we want? Do we think that God is so impressed by our worship that he will give a wink and a nod to our ungodly, unchristlike behavior? Or do we come to church to check the box on our spiritual checklist, to-do list, so we're good with God for another week or month or two months? One pastor put it this way, if you're just coming to church to hedge your bets, if you think worship attendance alone will count for something on Judgment Day, you're clearly wrong. Or do we come simply to see our friends, to reconnect with them? If so, we're coming for the wrong reason. At the church I served in Texas, a lady called me one day. She said, would you come over to my house? i got to talk to you. So I did. Older lady, she'd been a member of the denomination for 30 years. She said, I'm going to join the church, but I want you to know, I've come for the last three weeks, and not one person has said hello to me. I understand everybody's talking to their friends, and the reason they go is to be with their friends, but no one has reached out to me. May that not be said of us. 
If we're coming just to simply see our friends before and after the service, we're coming for the wrong reason as well. Or do we come to exert power and control over how we worship instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to direct us through the liturgy? The word worship in Greek is proskuneo, which means to bow down. We are here to bow down to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the triune God, the Father, and Holy Spirit, not for any other reason. May the Lord drive out of our hearts like he drove the animals out of the temple. Any reasons we come to church other than to pray from him, his mercy, grace, forgiveness, love, self, through word and sacrament. May we remember, as Arthur Just Jr. says in his book that I'm currently reading, Heaven on Earth, the Gifts of Christ in the Divine Service. God does not need our worship and praise and service, but we do need His service, His presence, and His gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Whatever praise we give to God, whatever honor is due His name, is our response to God's service to us. He goes on to say, the gifts of Jesus are hidden. In the simple means of water and word, bread and wine, we join a world outside ourselves by receiving gifts from heaven in the flesh of Jesus and submitting ourselves to the great mystery that heaven comes to earth through the bodily presence of the Savior. May our worship continue to praise, honor, and glorify God by exalting Jesus and no one else. And may we keep him high and lifted up So our worship continues to be a little slice of heaven on earth. And all God's people said. Break every chain, break every chain, 
break every chain. Last time. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Let's play our faith together by saying the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made, for us and of our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped to glorify. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up our hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to act like we should at all times and in all places. Offer thanks and praise to his holy name. And with the saints on earth and the host in heaven, join in our ending hymn. Against us, 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Or welcome back to the table, as it is the Lord's table. Come now and receive the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the goodness of your sins, come now with the Father's arms are open wide. If you haven't taken communion with us before, we have the bread and the juice in one element here. And just take that back to your seat, and then we will take it together. from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do He is 
David's rule in the land we died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and praise to God to reign with the sun. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of The blood of Christ shed for the remission of your sins. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the of love be our guide and path. For all of our days. <clears throat> Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Have a blessed week. Never hesitate to call. Never a burden. Always a blessing to talk with you. Call the office. Call me at home on my, or on my cell. I'd love to hear from you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Christ is with you. Sinners rest us all. Lead us by sinful urgent to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Yeah.
Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> nice to see your smile. <laughs> Jeff keeping us on our toes. <laughs> they thank you, Trent. Thank you, Mark. Mark slayed me with that song. Great job, you guys. <laughs>